Hi, everybody. I'm here once again with Mikhail Blagosconi, MD, PhD. I've talked to him a, a couple of times, at least already. And uh, of course, we've talked a lot uh, on our own without recording it. But um, I'm back with uh, Dr. Blagosconi again here today. And we're going to talk about rapamycin and hopefully some other things too uh, in terms of anti-aging. And so, uh, Misha, uh, welcome. Good to see you again. Thank you, Dennis. Always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, so, okay. So, you know, one of the things is a lot more people are taking rapamycin now, seemingly. Um, there are people who are uh, going to the doctors to get a prescription. There are some people who are taking it on their own. Um, but there seems to be a, an explosion of interest in rapamycin now compared to just a couple of years ago. Um, what do you think about that? What, why is that happening? And, and you know, what, do you, what do you have to say about all this? Uh, you used the uh, very right word, the explosion. It's uh, really like explosion of use of rapamycin. And just a few years ago, I was trying to be in contact with doctors who started treating patients with rapamycin, but now it's impossible. I don't remember, uh, uh, I would say, dozens and dozens of emails from doctors I'm receiving. I cannot keep any track. It's coming from not only the United States, from Europe. So, and um, of course, many patients take rapamycin without doctors, as we know, which uh, that we don't recommend, but it happens and will happen, of course. So, uh, I would call it some kind of revolution in perception of rapamycin, and it started couple of years ago, and it's uh, speeding up. And if you would like, I compare how it was 15 years ago about rapamycin. Sure, sure. Uh, um, I, I noticed, you know, what, what, let, just one remark about that is, I, I noticed that a couple of years ago or so, many people were much more concerned about side effects. And now they seem to be getting, you know, the right information as far as possible side effects. And people seem less concerned about it now and more concerned about, well, okay, I, you know, I want the anti-aging effects of rapamycin. Right. Uh, and it's natural because so many people taking, healthy people taking rapamycin. So people less concerned about imaginary side effects, which don't exist. Uh, some exist. I mean, people concerned about non-existent side effects. Right. So uh, I remember um, probably 15 years ago, I was on the party and talking to one member of National Academy of United States. Uh, he was pretty old himself. And I told him that there is a drug against aging. At the time I called it a mortality drug. So he said, oh, probably it's resveratrol. I said, no, it's not, it's rapamycin. And he said to me, but this is poison. I said, no. Uh, it's ext it will extend lifespan. At the time, it was no actually animal data that it extends lifespan. It was probably in uh, 2007. And he said, and this drug is used by patients for other purposes. And he said, you should not do this. You should test whether it kills mice. It will probably kill my kill my so tested. I said, 
It was tested 20 years ago. It's already, um, you can buy it in a pharmacy. Uh, and he was unable to believe this. He said, but anyway, even if it's used in humans for 10 years, you should first taste it, test it in mice. So it was the end of conversation. Yes, so I decided to test it on myself. It was not um, medication, it was a powder. It was um, rapamycin used for research. Like so, from, from a chemical supply house or, or something right. like that. Yeah, yes. Several people came to, to watch me how I will do it. Uh, so despite expectations, I didn't die. I, yes, <laughs> so it was great. But at the same time, uh, one uh, doctor from very famous hospital uh, emailed me. He said that he is taking one milligram of rapamycin per week, and one milligram now we know is very little. And he said that he keeps it in secret. Even he doesn't, didn't tell to his own wife about this. So weird it was at that time to take rapamycin. So he told me, yeah. And, and, and where do you suppose he got the idea? Did he got it, get it from reading the things that you had written or, or somewhere else? Well, in 20... Or six, I published very long paper, comprehensive aging and immortality about hyperfunction theory of aging. And uh, main conclusion of this prediction of this theory was that rapamycin is anti-aging drug. Uh, at that time, I thought it will make people almost immortal at that time. So I was very enthusiastic. And this, it was a problem to publish this paper because it was rejected very rapidly in all top journals like Nature Science. And uh, uh, in one of submission letters, I wrote that if it's not medication that will extend lifespan, then everything we know in biology is wrong because please just read the paper. Of course, no one read, it was rejected and finally it was published in a small journal. Yes, but before this publication, we were working several years before this publication, we were working on rapamycin and cell culture. It was a simple model that uh, when cell cycle is blocked, so cells cannot proliferate. But at the same time, they are overstimulated by growth signals, growth factors, which push them. So, but they cannot grow. So instead of becoming proliferating, they become senescent. So we tested rapamycin, rapamycin blocked senescence in these conditions. And from that, we were moving to general theory of hyperfunction, extending it to animals, not from cells to animals. So, uh, and uh, in 2009, it was a paper that um, uh, rapamycin extends lifespan in mice. At the same time, we also were doing similar study and we published it slightly later in two years, uh, in 2010. So one year later, our paper came out also. And after that, it was many, many, many other papers um, 
So, so presumably this doctor that you spoke to that was taking the one milligram rabamycin a week and keeping it secret got, he, he had read some of these early papers and, and got the idea that it would take, be a good idea to, to take rapamycin. Yeah. And uh, um, just one second. It's uh, okay. Uh, we can continue. Just somebody interrupted me, knocking the door of the house. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to. Uh, okay. Yes, and. Uh, Around 2016, uh, Dr. Green, uh, who read all these papers, tried rapamycin on himself. So uh, I don't need to tell this story because uh, he told it uh, to you on your interview in detail. So, sure. Yeah. And uh, after two years, because effect was remarkable, he was uh, just amazed. By he was re he was rejuvenated. Yes, yes. So he started treating patients, and now he has uh, more than eight hundred patients. And um, many other doctors started doing this two years ago, but uh, they don't publicize their practice as much as Dr. Green. So right. new clinics, we sometimes even don't know about their existence, uh, but they're opening everywhere. And um, especially, uh, and some new develop, developments that attracted attention of general public is development of anti-aging skin cream. And uh, it's also now produced in many uh, clinics and commercially. So, so Rapamycin becoming now mainstream medication to treat aging. And uh, at that point, I think that my mission is accomplished. Accomplished because uh, <laughs> I have nothing to do now anymore. Everything is going on by itself now now we'll just now we'll just be uh waiting for the nobel committee to to give you a prize and, and oh no no for, no, for no, that. no no it's uh, it's uh, I, I don't want to make impression that it's uh, all my um uh, fault that rapamycin uh, well you famous. there are many others uh, and Dr. Matt Kamberlin and many, many others. So in, yes. Well, and, you, cer uh, you certainly ha had a, a lot to do with it, um, for sure, for, for saying that this was going to happen, for making this theoretical prediction that it would extend lifespan. Um, so, so uh, Misha, um, you know, you've talked a lot about uh, I, I mean, I've seen you on Twitter talking a lot about, um, you know, ver uh, various rapalogs. So for those who don't know, a rapalog is a drug or a molecule that's similar to rapamycin, has the same mechanism of action, but, uh, but is not rapamycin, it's something different. One, one reason, uh, and, and I think this is worth pointing out, uh, 
just to connect the dots, one reason that many people are interested in developing new rapalogs is because rapamycin itself is off patent. It's a generic drug, and therefore a drug company can't make a lot of money with it. Um, and so at least this is my impression uh, as to why many, you know, there's a lot of interest in developing um, other rapalogs. And so you have you have noted that there there really isn't a need for other rapalogs. Um, it, it would also let me just go on a little bit about this for for people who don't know what rapamycin does mechanistically is it binds to a, a part of <clears throat> the mTOR mechanism called Raptor and and disables it basically. Um, so a drug that works like this, it either binds to it or it doesn't. Um, that that's uh, my impression anyway. You you so you have noted, um, for example, that everolimus is not used for anti aging. You've also said that um, a way to get less side effects from rapamycin, should that be desired, is just to use less rapamycin. Um, and so what, could you speak to some of this about the rapalogs, about everolimus, everolimus, um, and why it's not used for anti-aging and whether, you know, whether we need new rapalogs? Mm -hmm. uh, there is a little bit confusion. Some people say rapamycin and rapalogs. I prefer to say rapamycin and other rapalogs because rapamycin is prototypical natural rapalog. Other modification of rapamycin, modifications of rapamycin. So Iberalimus was first modification, which made it uh, water soluble, so could be used for injections in cancer patients. It has shorter half life, so it found and it was patented. So I think Navartis, yes, Navartis developed it, and it had great success in um, many indications. The same, almost the same as rapamycin indications. And uh, it was, I think at the time, like 20 times more expensive than rapamycin. I could be wrong now, but it was like one tablet costed $500. So it was very expensive, Iberalimus. And Iberalimus slightly weaker than rapamycin, but can be used in slightly larger doses. And it's almost identical, biological effects identical, side effects identical. So uh, why Iberalimus was not developed for anti-aging at the same time? Uh, first, uh, because it was actually patented. <laughs> so because of that, it was much more expensive to use in the laboratory and everywhere. So rapamycin was used. And aging is not recognized as a disease. So no reason for patented drug to be used in clinical trials against aging. because people confused a little bit. They think if it will be new Rapalog, which is patented, then Big Pharma will test it for life extension. No, it will not. So it doesn't matter that it's new and patented. Rapamycin will be used because it's already started. It would be also nice if Iberalimus will be used also. It has some differences, but then it should be started from the beginning again, from mice, 
which should be done, of course, then in, in the clinic for anti-aging. I hope it will happen because short half-life allow um, more precise um, schedules. Right, yes. right. Yes, so other repologues were developed and they didn't become really clinical drugs. Um, so if new repologues will be developed, yes, they will make money for some indications which are similar to rapamycin and viralimus. But, but um, it will not be probably specifically developed for anti-aging, although companies talking about this, but they're talking on preclinical stage. Uh, so, uh, yes. And I, I don't think that it would be a very different Repolog than Repomycin. Probably all of them will be similar. Uh, just they will be slightly weaker or weaker and will require higher doses. It's impossible in my mind to develop drug with zero targets. Repomycin has one target. So to make rapamycin without side effects, it must be zero targets. When in other drugs, uh, they target many, many usually proteins, and this is why side effects and you can do more selective, more selective and more selective, but you can do more selective than drug that already has one target. So, right uh, for for the benefit of uh, you know people people watching, let me just add a little a bit here. For example, drugs like metformin or aspirin have many many targets, um, and in fact, with drugs, and in fact, they're discovering new ones all the time. With metformin, for example, they're they're really not even sure exactly how it works or what is the most important drug, uh, most important target for this drug. Um, whereas rapamycin just has the one target, which is Raptor. And um, so this is, a, this is, I just want to clarify for people listening, this is an important distinction uh, among drugs, whether it has multiple targets or just one target. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Of course, it could be other mTOR inhibitors that are not repolog, like kinase inhibitors that target uh, both complexes of mTOR, mTOR C1, mTOR C2, PAN inhibitors, and they target PI3 kinase and many other kinases. So it's non-selective, but at lower doses, they could be more specific to mTOR C1. So it's another class uh, of drugs that unfortunately didn't develop yet and uh, unfortunately never was tried on longevity in mice. Uh, just about other epilogues besides rapamycin, none of them was tried to extend lifespan in animals. So this is awesome. So I think this Repolox will be developed more and more, but in forthcoming 10 years, they will not play any practical role. Maybe in 50 years, something will be changed. But right now we have two drugs. It's uh, rapamycin and Everolimus. Everolimus is not 
used because all research was most research was done on rapamycin although rap ivaralimus basically is almost twin of this drug and um, uh, so it's not that I'm against development of rapamycin, rapalox. Of course, I am supportive. It just doesn't stop treatment right now. It would be really foolish to do nothing and to die waiting when new rapalox will be developed, even though so far there is no reason to think that they will be better, even. Right, I, that that's an important point that, that um, uh, people people need help right now, and rapamycin is here right now, um, and 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 uh, you know it works, and uh, so it certainly works. Um, you know, when tested in animals, obviously humans live a long time, and there haven't been any you know systematic following of you know mortality rates and. But um, but it works and has few side effects and is here now. So why you know why would we wait for other rapalogs? Um, so uh, Misha, you, you um, one of the common questions I get uh, about rapamycin use is about how it affects physical exercise and how it, uh, you know, whether it might, specifically whether it might blunt the beneficial effects of physical exercise. Now, I, I feel like I have got an answer to that to my satisfaction, namely, it doesn't seem to, as far as I can, I can tell, but, you know, uh, let's go to the source, which is you, and what would you say about that? Uh -huh. Yeah, people uh, very much interested in this, of course. And uh, we both think that rapamycin and physical exercise is a perfect combination. There are many reasons for that. So about rapamycin alone, without physical exercise, by itself, it prevents sarcopenia and um, increase muscle strength in old animals. And we also know that sarcopenia often developed uh, loss of muscle in obesity. So it's completely opposite because rapamycin decreases obesity, but it's not its main effect, of course. Um, there are some controversials about mechanisms how rapamycin uh, protects aging muscle, but the fact is clear, it protects aging muscle. And about exercise, of course, by itself, exercise is a very important modality. I think the older person, the more important. I personally started exercise relatively recently and now exercise a lot. And uh, what about you, Dennis? Oh, well, as far as as far as exercise, yeah, I think it's extremely important. So uh, and I've been exercising in some form or other uh, all my adult life and and in exercising, of course, when I was a kid, in, you know, but not really thinking it was exercise. So yes, it, it's extremely important as far as muscle. Um, so you know, maintaining and keeping your muscle is extremely important in aging. Um, you, you know, you mentioned sarcopenia. So sarcopenia is a pathologic loss of muscle. Um, but you know, the fact is, just just like uh, you know, diabetes is the endpoint of a long chain of events of going through metabolic syndrome and prediabetes and then getting to diabetes. Well, sarcopenia is just the end stage of a long chain of events where people are losing muscle. Muscle loss starts relatively early in life, um, and it's and you can detect it in somebody by by the time they're around 30 years old, and then it accelerates 
as they get older. So it's extremely important to uh, to work on building muscle and keeping it as as you get older. So that's where the concern with uh, rapamycin comes in is is that so obviously you know older people rapamycin isn't necessarily just for older people, but presumably that would be a first case use and you want them to preserve their muscle. So like you, like you point out, it protects against sarcopenia in aged animals. So there, there seems to be little, if any, concern that, that uh, rapamycin would blunt the effects of exercise. Um, yeah, I mean, it was interesting, uh, a few years back, and and you know about this as well. They found that um, taking a gram of vitamin C every day blunted the effects of exercise um, in in human beings because of you know this antioxidant effect. Exercise is a stress, and um, if you blunt the effects of that stress, then then it blunts the beneficial effects of exercise. So yeah, obviously, um, obviously exercise is extremely important. And, you know, so, so, uh, you know, perhaps combining it with rapamycin is the best thing. Um, you, so, you, you know, um, I asked on Twitter uh, yesterday about uh, that. I, I, I mentioned that I was going to be talking to you and, um, uh, I asked people if they had questions for you, like, which, what should I ask you? So I had a few questions here. Um, one question that came up a fair amount was people asking about the use of grapefruit juice um, with rapamycin. Now, uh, I'll, I'll explain to people what grapefruit juice does. So gra grapefruit juice um, basically disables temporarily uh, some of the cytochromes that are in uh, the lining of the intestines and in that are in the liver as well that metabolize drugs. So if you, certain drugs. And so if you knock out these cytochromes, then you have a greater absorption of these drugs. Um, there was a study, they, they studied this systematically where patients were taking, were, were drinking grapefruit juice every day and taking rapamycin. And they got, uh, I think, a, about a threefold higher blood level of rapamycin when they were also taking the grapefruit juice. Anyway, I, I guess the question is, do you think this is a good idea? Uh, so uh, <laughs> Pfizer specifically warned, don't take uh, grape juice when you take rapamycin. Uh, because it's increased rapamycin effect threefold. And many people take grape, grape juice, uh, gra um, grape juice when Gr they take Grapefruit juice, yes. Yes, I, I know these people personally well. So, because it's allowed to take less rapamycin because rapamycin was, not maybe now, but at least even recently, was difficult to get. Uh, not many physicians wanted to prescribe and so on. So it was a physical clinical trial of combination of rapamycin and grapefruit juice, specifically to save money uh, for on rapamycin to use three times slow doses. It, it worked perfectly well. Uh, and patients liked this combination of uh, rapamycin and, and the juice. But <clears throat> the only problem here, first uh, several small, there are very different types of juice, not very, but slightly. So some grapefruit juice has more potent, some less potent. So it's difficult to calculate, right? And second, if someone takes several drugs, not only rapamycin, grape um, fruit juice can affect other drugs, by the way. So then it will be really difficult. And um, 
of course, probably medical doctors, your primary doctors wouldn't like this idea of this combination. So in general, probably it's better to use rapamycin without juice because it will be more clear how much person uh, takes instead of uh, calculation, recalculation, which could be not very um, exact calculations and will not be involved doctors and so on. But prices on rapamycin going down, right? We observe this. So, right. yes, so probably it will not be a problem in the future. Okay, okay, all right, great. Um, another uh, question that uh, I got uh, se several people asked this about is, was combinations of rapamycin with other potential longevity drugs. I know you've written about that in um, some of your articles, you know, for example, PDE5 inhibitors. Um, what, what do, you know, what, what do you currently think is an, an ideal combination, if any? And let me just add, um, I saw someone saying, and I, I, I can't remember who this was, but somebody said, um, somebody mentioned that he was taking rapamycin and somebody, this, this was on Twitter, and someone asked him, well, what, what other things are you taking for longevity? And he said nothing, because I know that rapamycin is the absolute best thing there is, so I don't need to take any, anything else. Um, what, what would you say about that? Do you, do you think that's uh, uh, reasonable or true or false, or, or do you think uh, other, other drugs might um, uh, be useful also with rapamycin? I think other drugs will be useful with rapamycin, but it's not very really clear about these other drugs. So this position to take only rapamycin is also fine, I would say, uh, currently. So uh, what other drugs? Combination with metformin, for example, I believe it would be a good combination, but we ha don't have data on this combination. So uh, this is a problem. It's just assumption that it would be good because each of them is good. And um, some other uh, combination, and it could include other drugs that showed life extension in animals and already used in humans, because this is sufficient and necessary for human use. Uh, used in humans, extend lifespan in animals. So it could be um, inhibitors of uh, angiotensin to systems, which extend lifespan in rodents. And it could be, um, of course, uh, aspirin, which life extension is small, but it has some benefits, but it has many side effects. So this question should be decided by primary physician, use or not to use aspirin, for example. And um, there are some emerging data on PD-5 inhibitors like um, uh, Viagra and... Uh, uh, Cialis uh, is another one. Cialis, mostly yeah. Cialis now is used for age-related, some age-related diseases, including, by the way, in women also. And um, there are very acarbos, but acarbos maybe could be substituted by low um, carb diet. 
right. which we like, we both like the same day, right? Yeah. Yeah, let, let, let me, uh, if, I, uh, if I can just inter interject something there about A-Carbos, so that's very interesting. So A-Carbos, uh, for those that don't know, is a um, relatively common drug. I think it's not used so much in the United States, but it's used a fair amount elsewhere. It's an anti-diabetic drug. It does extend lifespan in animals. And what does A-Carbos do? It prevents the absorption of carbohydrates. And so the obvious inference is if you just don't eat carbohydrates, you're going to get the same, uh, you know, lifespan extension effect that those animals got from a carbos. Anyway, sorry to interrupt, but what are, are there any other drugs that, um, oh, and I'll, uh, also, uh, let me just note also that these things you're talking, so you mentioned metformin, a carbos, aspirin, PDE5 inhibitors, um, and, and angio, you right, angio, uh, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme uh, inhibitors. Uh, so the interesting thing about all this, it's, to me, it's very interesting anyway, is that these are all very common drugs that are co very commonly prescribed, and um, a lot of people are taking them. And and so what. The, the overall thing here is that, uh, well, rapamycin itself, to me and, and to most people, probably seems fairly esoteric. Not, not that many people are taking it clinically, um, you know, for, for an actual uh, medical problem. But the other ones are, um, you, you know, the, the, the metformin, the aspirin, and, and, and PDE5 inhibitors and so on. They're, they're very common. This is one thing I've noted or thought of anyway. There are a lot of uh, startup companies trying to, um, you know, figure out some kind of lifespan extending technology or drug or whatever it might be. And, you know, which is, which is fine. Uh, you know, we need people to keep researching all this, but the fact is a lot of this is just here right now. The most effective things that we know of that will extend lifespan are here now, and they're just not that uncommon, these drugs. And then if we're talking about low carb diet, uh, you know, and exercise, and of course, uh, you know, things like keeping your iron levels low, um, you know, that that's one that not too many people know about. So they're all here now. Um, and, you know, another common question that um, I that people ask is, what age is a good time to start taking rapamycin? Uh, yeah, this is a very really difficult question. Initially, I thought it should be started very early in life during development, but results in mice showed that it could be started very late in life and work perfectly very late. So it's never late to start. But still um, later, it could be done some studies um, about rapamycin during development because there is probably one sensitive time when it could be reprogrammed just taking it early for later but at that moment we don't have data on that but probably will but um so uh, it's impossible to say at what age to start it's mostly depends on how much uh, a person wants to take rapamycin rather than specific age. And what is important to avoid side effects because anti-aging treatment should be without side effects by definition. If side effects developed, decrease dose, or if you're a young person, stop, whatever. No reason to to take this, to take rapamycin despite uh, side effects, unless 
it's more psychological side effects that you are willing to tolerate. So, uh, and when young people would like to start, well, it's it's a very complicated question, really. Right. Uh, I don't see big reasons not to to take sm small doses of rapamycin early in life, uh, but at the same time, don't want to encourage people to start it too early. Yes. Um, it should be investigated a little bit more. Right, right. I, I, it, I mean, it's interesting. I, I mean, you know, people, you know, reasonably want to find some answers to these things, but unfortunately, there aren't very many good answers right now. People are, you know, they're we're, you know, flying by the seat of our pants, so to speak, when it comes to human use of rapamycin for anti-aging. Um, I had another question and um, about autoimmune disease. Someone was asking, does rapamycin work uh, or can one take rapamycin when one has an autoimmune disease? And what's, what's the deal there? Uh -huh. In general, yes, because uh, rapamycin actually was developed for this purpose. Uh, and used in organ transplantation, although it's not autoimmune, but it's closed mechanism. So it was tried for treatment of autoimmune diseases successfully. So it's a good application. But once again, uh, there are many autoimmune diseases and many conditions. So for that purpose, it should be prescribed by um, primary physician. Or it's uh, it's not that we can say, oh, just take uh, rapamycin sure. if you have it. So, but I don't see autoimmune diseases as con contraindication, at least. Right. Right. Okay. Um, well, uh, Misha, I, I, I think we'll be wrapping it up here. Um, you know, thanks for coming on. Do you, do you have any uh, final words uh, to say for, for the audience? Final words that I hope we will talk again soon because we didn't cover uh, many important topics. And I look at it's already one hour. So uh, I would like to meet uh, you, Dennis, again soon and to talk more. Okay, that would be great. I'd love to do that. Um, thanks for coming on, uh, doc Dr. Blagosloni, and it was great talking to you as usual. And thanks everybody for watching and listening. And we'll be talking to uh, Dr. Blagosloni again soon, I hope. Okay. Thank Th thanks. Thanks a lot, Misha. Thank you, Denise.